Good evening, my name is Dr. Morrison and I'm going to be your instructor this semester for ELE 385 Advanced Digital Systems. This is a video recording for extra credit lecture zero. Uh, going over the syllabus justifies the reason why I do certain things in the class the way that I do uh, and give you an opportunity to get a leg up on uh, your grade before the class even starts. So uh, I'm starting out here with uh, a comic from a, uh, a website called phdtopics.com. This is something that professors typically will, professors and TAs tend to laugh at a lot more than students will, but I uh, figure this is a good uh, look into the mindset of how your professors and teaching assistants think when you ask questions. Uh, like what we covered last week is in the syllabus. What's your late homework policy? It's in the syllabus. What's your office hours? It's in the syllabus. Like how we might create computed. Yeah, it's mostly it's all there. Uh, and the syllabus is a uh, basically a contract between professor and student to let you know uh, ex expected course policies, expected due dates, uh, certain things that I'm held to, certain things you're held to, uh, in order to make sure that uh, you're, uh, you receive the fair grade that reflects your uh, performance expectation from the course. So um, in, the in the email I sent out to you, uh, I have a set of 10 questions that you will be able to answer based on this video. Um, the first one is what are my email, office number, and office hours. So my email is simply morrison at olmiss.edu. Uh, my office is 310 Anderson Hall, and my office hours are Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 1 to 3 or by appointment. So this is the answer to number one. This is, or by appointment is an important detail. Um, when you if you for some reason have a class during this time, Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, it is fine to email me and we can set up a time for you to come in for your own unique uh, appointment to at address any questions that you happen to have about the course. Uh, yeah, I've required you to have the Patterson Hennessy textbook, uh, Computer Organization and Design, the Hardware Software Interface. We'll be using this uh, quite a bit. Uh, it is probably the industry uh, leader. Uh, in this uh, material. I think it's very good for advanced digital systems and will prepare you well for when you have to take uh, computer organization later on. Additionally, we're going to be doing a lot of C programming in this course, so I've recommended uh, the Kernighan and Ritchie, the C programming language. They are the two individuals uh, who invented C. So even if uh, for some reason you're not going to, uh, we weren't considering getting the textbook, I did make it recommended, it is a good idea to have access to this uh, because C is a procedural language, I'm um, oh, sorry, it's a functional language, and you've been learned up to this point. You've learned C++ and Java, so you've been learning functional lang uh, procedural languages. So uh, it's good to understand C in order to really have a good understanding of an advanced digital system. Uh, in order to take this course, you need to have uh, passed with a C or better uh, three, 235 and 236. Um, and we're going to be learning a lot about computer architecture, register transfer languages, memory, arithmetic, logic. Uh, we're going to be learning a lot about pipelining, addressing modes, uh, and parallel processing. For uh, number two, what are my grade breakdowns? So this is the answer to number two right here. Uh, the scale is included there. So test one, test two, and the final are all 20% each. Uh, I give pop quizzes. I'll be talking about why I make them pop uh, later on. Um, topical guide objectives are worth 10%. Uh, percent. I will describe what topical guide objectives are. And the C projects, which will be in groups, are also 20%. Uh, and I grade on the typical 90, 80, 70, 60 curve. Um, this statement here, upward grade adjustments are possible depending on the average distribution of final class averages for all students in the class. Here's what this means. I can round up and give you a better grade. So let's say you have an 88. I am allowed to give an upward grade adjustment. Why this is important in the syllabus, I cannot say, well, you have a 91. I'm going to give you a B. I am not allowed to do that by having that in the syllabus. I'm contractually obligated. Um, Second part here, the final exam is cumulative, though a heavy emphasis will be placed on the final one-third of the course material. Um, as you'll see when we talk about top of guide objectives, my students are typically very well prepared for what's coming on the exams. 
and uh, you will know precisely what it is I will be expecting. Usually the exam review is about five minutes long and I ask, what do you think will be on the exam? And you guys, after having, uh, you guys and ladies, of course, uh, after you, uh, you will tell me what you think is going to be on the exam and it's typically very, very close uh, or right on the nose. Um, usually it'll be some subset of the, uh, uh, of what you said will actually be the exam. So what I have here, uh, upon completion of the course, a student may credibly claim on a resume. I have a lot of material online already for professional development, being able to start to develop a resume, starting to be able to put it in a proper way that will make you look uh, desirable to employers. You're going to learn about C, RTL coding, Cadence, and Xilinx. Uh, that's, that should not be there. Um, digital systems, computer architecture, gate level simulation, static timing constraints analysis, logic equivalence verification, software programming, debugging, assembly language, and Microsoft Visual Studio. You will have extensive knowledge on the techniques and principles of digital systems, register transfer language, static timing analysis, and logic validation. You will be skilled in communicating technical information in a precise and concise manner using verbal and written communication skills to present results. This will be where uh, your projects come into play, and I'll describe precisely how I expect you to present your results uh, in a manner that is beneficial for you in industry. Um, and we will be learning, you'll be learning, you'll have designed a 32-bit MIPS data path in C by the time you're done. Um, I have included a lot here about ABET objectives. This is the Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology. This is what we have to meet in order to make your degree valid. Um, ability to apply mathematics and science and engineering, an ability to design components or processes, an ability to identify and formulate and solve engineering problems, an understanding of professional and ethical responsibility. I uh, will go into quite a bit of detail about this later in this video. Uh, ability to communicate effectively, uh, a recognition of and the need for an ability to engage in lifelong learning, uh, a knowledge of contemporary issues, uh, we will go quite a bit into contemporary issues in this course, and an ability to use the techniques, skills, and modern engineering tools necessary for engineering practice. So the course outcomes, we're going to take uh, medium scale integration, we're going to learn what that means. and so. Medium scale integration means any computer chip between uh, 100 and 1,000 transistor sizes and build those into more complex digital circuits. You'll be able to design projects in C and as well as combinational and sequential state machines. You'll be able to use current engineering software to compile and stimulate circuits. You'll know the architecture of computer systems. They'll calculate computing performance, knowing the operation of components of a basic computing system and then using those to build an architecture, and knowing the relationship between the hardware architecture and the computer's assembly language instruction set. Course policies. I expect you to show up every day. Uh, I do not, uh, I'm not going to, you know, ba basically, you, you, I have daily required assignments uh, and you will show up every day. Basically, the way you're at at this point in this uh, point in your academic career, you're aspiring to be professionals. Uh, you want to have a job. You got to show up every day, and you got to show up every day on time. Um, you have, to, and also, uh, I do not expect people to miss all the class. Then try to get the students who have been coming to class to give them the information. Earn your own degree is my attitude. Uh, for those of you who have been nice and have been helping other people. You're welcome to come by. I have all three of my degrees here, and you'll see that my only my name is on it. So if I had taken advantage of everybody else, well, they didn't cre get credit for my degree. So I expect everybody to pass on their own. Your grade will reflect your work. If you don't, then uh, then you're not going to get your grade. So uh, what I do do is I post the lecture notes uh, every day after uh, class. This is where I will post them at this link. Uh, this is the answer to number three. State the YouTube website where lecture notes will be posted. So you can go here and you've, you already are on this page because you're seeing this video. Um, I do expect you to come here every day, but this is to supplement your class notes. Uh, here's why I post videos to YouTube. And I also talk about here, this answer to number four. So here's number three. And... Here's number four. So number four is describe why I post videos to YouTube but do not post notes to Blackboard. 
So I will be uh, reading lecture off a of PDF, uh, and I'll be marking it up just like I am here, um, and describing information to you. I do not post those PDF notes. I find that uh, this approach maximizes student understanding. You're in class, you're paying attention, then you can go back, do the top of guide objectives. You can actually hear what I am saying. Uh, however, I find that when uh, you just post the PDFs online, people just distribute them, and that actually increases instances of academic dishonesty. So, in short, that I do it this way to help you and to prevent your, uh, some people from hurting themselves. So, number five, what does TGO stand for? TGO stands for Topical Guide Objective. You'll be very used to this term by the end of the semester. Um, my motivation for using this material um, is to teach students how to study. Uh, I, was a, um, I was a nuclear reactor operator in the United States Navy, and this is the method that we use to get students through uh, one, of the mo one of the most difficult curriculums in the entire world um, and do so quickly. Um, the motivation is teach you how to study and then you help you develop a study guide for exams and preparing for job interviews. You're not just in this class because you uh, because you want a good grade. You, well, you ultimately want a job. That's why you're here, right? So I want to help you do that. So what you oftentimes when you go to job interviews, jobs, uh, the companies will say, we want you to read this textbook, this textbook, and this textbook. Uh, if anything that requires a digital systems like you're in this course, they will typically ask for Patterson Hennessy. So you can either dig through, try to find another copy of Patterson Hennessy, or you can have your compiled topical guide objectives and go through it in a way that's effective and will help you in interviews. I base a lot of the topical guide objectives off of questions that I hear from, from interviews, feedback I get from industry. You'll see a lot during my lectures where I will discuss a, a topic and then I'll have an industry feedback note where it says, all right, I've talked to an industry person. They said, you really need to know this because why? Uh, and as a result, you'll be able to understand why it is that you're learning what we are learning in class. So number six, they are due at the beginning of class. My policy, uh, number six, when are the TGOs due and what should you do if you can't make it to class on time? My TGO policy is, actually this is number seven, uh, any homework, any homework not submitted by 8 p.m. without an email or notification as to why they are late will receive an automatic zero. I do not accept late homework without a valid excuse. If I have started lecture, please do not turn in your homework until I have completed lecture, at which point we will discuss whether or not I'll accept your homework. This is important. Um, if you're late once or twice, that's understandable. Uh, the one thing I expect you to do is to not be a habitual line stepper. If you constantly show up late to class, that's I will not accept your homework assignment. It's not fair to the students who are coming on time every day and turning in their homework every day to accept their home to accept their homework for full credit if you're constantly coming in late. Because let's face it, some students they show up late, they're working on the homework at the last minute. Um, and instead of just admitting it, uh, they, they'll just uh, lie. I will, I will reward you for your integrity. If you show up late and you tell me why you're late, uh, you say, oh, it's an idiot, or I missed the bus, or um, you just say, hey, listen, I didn't do my homework, I'm sorry, I'll work with you. I will always reward integrity. I will always reward integrity. But if you lie to me, that's when we have issues. Which brings me to uh, number seven. Uh, what is a course policy regarding submission of TGOs? My course policy is failure to earn a 70% average on TGOs will result in automatic D or worse in the course regardless of exam performance. I expect you to submit your homework every day. It's straightforward. Um, what, so the other thing I should note here is I expect the assignments to be handwritten. I have this here. They are to be handwritten. So answer eight, in the audio I described three reasons why I require homework to be handwritten, state them. 
So I even say type submissions receive an automatic zero out of 10. If you type your homework and submit it, you'll get a zero, plain and simple. My first motivation for this was uh, I had a student my very first year of teaching who uh, would type up the assignments and then give them to other students who kind of pressured him into doing it. And he didn't feel he could admit it until after the semester was over. So with the typed assignments, um, in this particular student, I, I felt this was, I call it academic bullying. Give me your homework, give me your homework, give me your homework. If you handwrite it, it's not possible. Um, I have had students who will use stylus. Uh, if you use a stylus, that's fine, as long as you're handwriting the stylus. Don't use a program that converts it to a text editor. Just have it in your own handwriting. But as long as it's in your stylus, it's fine. So that's reason one, prevention of academic bullying. What I found, and this is reason number two, some have, requiring submission of handwritten homework actually improves overall student performance. Uh, their grades went up from the first year to the second year and can stayed up since I've done this by about 4% on average. Uh, and I think the reason why is, exam is uh, for reason three, it helps students prepare for their exam the way they do with the quiz. Uh, so let me rephrase that. What I mean is that oftentimes students will be preparing, typing their homework, or they will uh, do it in a way that it doesn't isn't being done on exam. So if you can think of any coding class where you've written code in uh, and you're typing it, and then you expect to handwrite the code, and you're not used to it. You're used to the compiler fixing things for you, and people struggle in class. What I want you to do is I want you to prepare for the exam the same way that I prepare for your homework. So that's those are the three reasons. Prevention of academic dishonesty, improvement of student performance, proper preparation for exams. So uh, quizzes. So I mentioned earlier that I have pop quizzes. Uh, quizzes are unannounced. And But here's the thing. Ooh, that's not good. Quizzes are unannounced, but here's the thing. If you're there, 50% of the quiz grade will account for your attendance. So the quiz, what that means is the quizzes are out of 100 points, right? But by putting your name on the paper, you get plus 50 right off the bat. You showed up, you were there. Now, this other 50 points is an opportunity for you to be honest with yourself about where you're actually at. So, but you've got a built-in 15-point curve. Don't freak out. I just want you to say, oh, I don't know uh, this. I do know this, and I do know this. And by the way, students who are getting 95s or 100s probably should earn a slightly higher grade than students who come in and get like a 53, right? I just think that's fair to students who are keeping up with the material that they get the A plus or the, you know, instead of the A minus. I think this is like separate grades here. However, um, by doing this, you'll have practiced the problem. You've done so in a way which you weren't prepared for it, so you know precisely what you do know and don't know, and you'll be able to review for exams. Like I said here, the purpose is to make you allow you to be honest with yourself about what you truly know. So these are the relevant uh, dates. Uh, classes began on the 24th, that's Monday. Your class begins on Tuesday, the 25th at 9.30. Uh, September 8th is the last day we withdraw and be able to get a refund. Uh, deadline for close withdrawals is October 5th. So as you'll notice, I have uh, an assignment for v, uh, the, their C code the day before. So I will have it graded so you can make an intelligent or um, well-informed decision about whether or not you want to stick with the course. Uh, Midterm grades are due October 15th. Um, I send out emails to every student indicating where their grade is and where I think they can get to. Uh, students can typically struggle on exam one but do well on exam two, or I can see that they're working really hard but they struggled and we're going to address things so I can give them an honest assessment of where they're going to be. Um, the Thanksgiving holidays are the 23rd through the 27th. I have the part one and part two of the final project due uh, right before that, and then the last day. You have December 1st, the final Tuesday of class is your final exam. And then Thursday, uh, I have a pizza party and I will return your grades. So every student, uh, 
get some pizza, and I will have your grades printed out. I will shake your hand, look you square in the eye. This is where your grade is. If you And uh, the last thing we'll talk about with projects is it's due December 5th. That date's wrong. So this, um, by, you'll be able to know you if you get this grade on the project, you'll get this. If you get this grade, you'll get that, so forth. I think it's very important for professors to look in their uh, students square in the eyes. This is just to say fall 2015, by the way, um, and be able to tell them their grade. Like the grade I'm going to give you is going to have an impact on your ability to get a job. So I should be able to do it in a way where I can look you square in the eye. Um, this is the course outline I've described here. Um, C projects, you're going to be doing coding in C. I'm going to teach you how to do C coding. Uh, and particularly, I'm going to emphasize very heavily how to actually code and design a project in a good way that's very professional and reduces coding time. A lot of time in coding is wasted by, by not planning the project properly. So I'm going to heavily emphasize project planning and commenting. Um, in, incompletes will not be given unless it's for a personal or family emergency. Uh, religious observance, if you have to miss class for any reason due to a religious observance, you need to let me know by the second week of class. Um, there's a memorandum of understanding you can get from the Office of Student Disability Services if you have a disability. Um, if you have one, you probably know what I'm talking about. If you don't, you probably don't. Um, so there. So anyway, um, the last thing I want to talk about, number nine, and then we'll go to my uh, website here. Um, academic integrity. I take this very seriously, uh, as you should, since you're aspiring engineers, if you're in this, or computer scientists or engineers, if you're in this class. Uh, we have the work that we do has impacts on people's lives. And I'll say, I say right here, as aspiring engineering professionals, you are to approach academic integrity with the utmost sincerity. We have a responsibility to society to perform good and honest work. The public places their trust and well-being in you every time you do work. If you cheat, you've demonstrated that you're incapable and or unwilling to meet the standard, and I will act accordingly. Your commitment to integrity is every bit as important, if not more so, than the grade you earn on your transcript. It is better to get a B in my class the right way than to try to get an A the wrong way. I promise you, it's better in the long run. The One of the proudest grades I ever have when that I ever got when I was a grad student was a B in compilers because I worked my butt off. That class kicked my butt a little bit. But by the end of this semester I wrote my own compiler and I'm proud of that. And I did it the right way. And students were kicked out because they cheated because they ran up against the adversity and didn't do it. And the, here's the key thing and this is the answer to number nine, state my course policy regarding academic honesty offenses. So this is answer to number nine. Incident one, I will require you to write a one-page paper on an engineering incident where failure to uphold ethical principles resulted in catastrophe. For example, the Kansas City uh, Marriott walkway collapse or the Challenger explosion or Ford Firestone. There's lots of examples, but the key thing is that when you lie and you cheat or you manipulate numbers to sound like you did things that you didn't, we can potentially kill people. And I take so you need to take this very, very seriously. The as, as, essay must be in your own words. Plagiarism of that essay will result automatically in incident two. So this is incident one. If you get a second incident, I will give you an F in the course. Just straight up F in the course, uh, not deal with any probation, any that you'll just get an F in the course. If you get two Fs in uh, in a course and as an electrical engineer anyway, uh, you're out of the program regardless. Um, and the third part is, and uh, hopefully this doesn't apply to anybody, but this is an important detail. If you have a previous incident of academic dishonesty on your record during your academic career, I will automatically assign you a grade of F on your first incident. So if I catch you cheating and I look into your background and I find out that you have already been caught cheating, you will get an F automatically. You've already been given your chance. And so for the rest of this, I have described, I've highlighted some stuff out of the M book, uh, who, uh, where I've seen instances in the past. Um, like I said, we were talking about coding projects. Um, if you obtain another group's code and present it as your own, this qualifies as attempting or attempting to gain an unfair advantage. 
which is listed in the M book. Um, stealing books or materials, if you steal someone's other someone's top of that objectives, uh, that's uh, going to be an issue. Falsely attesting work that has been done when it has not been. Um, I see this is something you see all the time, and I'm sure in code in group projects you have come across somebody like this. Um, if I find a member is not contributing their fair share of the work through active or passive means, by active I mean like coercing classmate visibly, verbally or physically to do their work for them, or passive, meaning ignoring emails or claiming his work is being done, and then due dates and then here and you find out, oh, they didn't do it, and they're trying to coerce the uh, classmate to do it that way. Um, that's not acceptable, and you, we've all seen instances of that. Um, if you're saying the work's been done, it hasn't been done, and that's called falsely attesting work, giving false information or altering documents. Very clear. If you, if I find you're doing that, you're in trouble. You know, you're going to contribute to your group project. If uh, I'm sure everybody knows somebody who's tried to ride their coattails this far, I hope that if you're uh, at this point in your academic career, where that means you've probably been weeded out. I mean, I'm sorry. The uh, if if you're at this point, then those people have been weeded out. If you have been one of those people, that ends now. You either need to figure out how to do your work or not be an engineer. It's cl uh, clear uh, other ones I highlighted disruptive behavior uh, behavior that disrupts the academic environment and violates the standard of fair access so uh, this you're typically not going to see this in engineering but you know you get to these classes uh, in fine arts where people are screaming at the professor and they don't like whatever they're saying or some reason that's you can be kicked out of class for that and finally violations are not limited to the areas and examples given um, if I find other things that you may have done in order to try to cheat uh, this does not limit me to that. Um, so that's pretty much everything that's stated in the M book about academic dishonesty. Uh, last but certainly not least, this is my professional page. Um, Sites.google.com slash site slash Ole Miss VLSI. VLSI stands for Very Large Scale Integration. Um, you can find information here about me, um, my CV and my resume. I am in Anderson 310, as you know by now. Uh, so this is some of my background. Um, I received all of my degrees at the University of South Florida. You can actually go up here and you can find my uh, PhD dissertation if you so choose for what it, those are some of the kinds of things that you'd want to do. It's uh, pretty long, so it's going to take you a while to read. Um, honors and awards, blah, blah, blah. Uh, past teaching and evaluations. Here's the thing that matters to you. Um, in the past, I've, I post all of my teaching evaluations. Uh, I need to update my CMOS. Um, but so last, I post all of my teacher evaluations without comment. Uh, I basically just so every student has the opportunity to see uh, what I got, what I've done in the last year, teaching evaluation results, student comments, um, particular, uh, typically score. Let's see, I got like a four point. 9, 1 out of 5 last year. These are student comments here, uh, what the students were saying about uh, last year. Uh, in particular, you can see how the student feedback has uh, contributed to your current amount of work or the current um, course. Uh, let's see. You can go through here and see everything that students have written in the past. Um, that's important. I really should post. I'll post this uh, as soon as I'm done with this video, uh, so you everybody you can see what is going on there. Uh, I posted all of my teacher evaluations from the past. You can see all of this different uh, information there. So, is that 45? Oh, that's 385. Okay, so I'll fix that. Anyway, um, and he, here I posted some information for you. Uh, here's your electrical engineering advising sheets. So for those of you who are trying to get out of school as fast as you can, you can actually go here and you can look at the PDFs and it says what classes you need to take. Um, there's also a computer engineering emphasis, which I'm heading up. And you can see the specific courses here and biomedical engineering as well. 
uh, professional organizations that are smart for you to be able to join, particularly IEEE, ACM, Computing Research Association, uh, Tau Beta Pi, uh, Society of Women's Engineers. All of these websites are very good for being able to find scholarship opportunities or job opportunities. A lot of them have conferences. I know that SWE has a conference in Baltimore every year, and Tau Beta Pi has a conference in San Francisco every year, um, and IEEE has conferences all over the place. Um, and you can use these this information to find jobs. So I have compiled here the ACM, IEEE, engineering.com job listings. Additionally, I have posted the job links for all kinds of different companies here. Um, I've indicated which ones are U.S. defense contractors. They may require special, special security clearance. Um, so you can use this information, graduate fellowship programs, none of your grad students. Uh, uh, for those of you who are veterans, um, there's uh, not only Ole Miss Veterans Affairs, but the Career for Veterans and Intel Military Support. They're very good about uh, helping people who are veterans uh, get employed. And in fact, the uh, resume and, that I have posted on Blackboard, if we go here, you'll see professional development. I have posted sample uh, resumes and uh, cover letters. And we can go over this and discuss uh, precisely how should look. So let's click open with, and I've kind of based it off of uh, what my career is, but the key details are being able to uh, look at it in a way that, here we go. So you put your own, this phone number, kind of put your email. Uh, you want to teach a lot about technical schools. So you see technical tools and skills. I have that on your syllabus, professional experience. Um, a lot of these jobs will have uh, information about professional experience. How do you convey a project that you did in class into resume information? So that way you can actually say, well, I've done a project on this and you can convey that. And part of this C project is you're going to be able to have code that you can then use to upload when you apply for jobs. People can actually look at your commented code and look at your work and be able to, you know, get good work here. So, and we can go over all of that, but that's kind of just on there for you. Uh, and they talked a lot about power verbs and cover letters. So we can, we'll be going over things like this. So you'll see lots of examples during lecture. I'll have uh, job descriptions that will show precisely the kinds of things that uh, you'll be looking for. So anyway, the last thing, and you've probably been wondering when I was going to get to number 10. Um, on the front page here, I have these two statements. And this is the answer to number 10. Here, my number ten. Uh, let me change, pick a different uh, color here. For number ten, said on my professional website, I have my teaching vision and teaching mission. State them. My teaching mission statement is to develop computer engineering students academically, creatively, and morally, and to engender ideals of integrity, professionalism, and lifelong learning and teaching in order to graduate engineers who are dedicated to a career of utilizing the principles of science for humanity's benefit. And a teaching vision is to develop one of the best computer engineering programs in the world by imbuing students with world-class study habits by combining Navy teaching methods with modern engineering tools. So uh, one last thing. Uh, go here, I can see Triple E Explore, we'll miss. Uh, all of you have access to uh, this kind of information. Sorry, it's taking so long to download. But you can go here to this website. If you go into Google or Yahoo, you can just trip, type in IEEE Explore, and it'll bring up a link for you to be able to uh, put in your personal information. So let me put this back here while it's uploading. Uh, I My teaching method, I presented on it last March. I was up at Princeton University uh, to talk about the teaching method that we're using here at Ole Miss. And for some reason, it's taking forever. Um, but the key thing is that I based it a lot off of my nuclear power school experience. And I'm very passionate about this idea that oftentimes students who didn't get into one of the Ivy League schools right off the bat are kind of just discarded. Um, I can go in here. Good luck guessing that. And then once it goes on, but anyway, uh, 
I, I am the type of person I was like, well, if you're here, I'm going to teach you. I've seen that how the best are taught. I'm going to teach you how to do that so that way you can continue that in your academic career. So uh, what I can do here is if you go through IEEE Explorer, we, we can actually uh, get the PDF. And so now that I have a presentation on I pr uh, wrote a paper on here. So what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to actually download it for you and uh, then get this. So here's my paper on it, a Tripoli STEM Integrated Education Conference hosted by Princeton. Um, here's the PDF. And I will download it for you and I'll post it on Blackboard so you can see uh, the effectiveness uh, and go into more detail as to why I teach the way I teach. I think it's very important for students I, the common thing is you uh, don't really figure out a st uh, professor until the second exam, uh, what they what they want to do and why. Um, and I have written up here a paper. Uh, this is a good example right here of kind of what lecture looks like. So topical guide objectives will start and end here. I can tell you that the topical guide objective here is define execution time, throughput, and performance in relationship to one another. And then I have example questions, so I just we actually use performance and execution time to determine the throughput. So everything kind of relates to one another. And then I have industry quotes here. Uh, high performance computing is widely recognized and regarded as an essential tool for enabling science as an indispensable integral part of virtually all semiconductor research endeavors. So knowing how to improve performance in computing is very important, so you should really understand all of these concepts. Um, and then I compare the difference. Uh, this are the semesters I TA a course, and we weren't using TGOs. And you can see the improvement in grades really quickly. Uh, I, we, we were using the same material, and eventually we were able to significantly improve uh, how much material was covered. Uh, so you can see, using the exact same grading rubrics, we went up from 77.1 to 88.5%. Um, same thing we're going through here uh summer 2012 and these are te teaching evaluation feedback students tend to really like this information um how how do there's seven different ways of learning visual auditory verbal physical solitary social and logical and my teaching method figures out ways to get all seven of these so i give a presentation on this at princeton uh save file and so I, what I can do is I can go into top of Google guide objectives here. And while it's doing that, I can upload it for you. So that way you can read that in more detail. So please feel free to send me an email about anything you want to know. Uh, IEEE STEM Princeton paper. Browse my computer downloads, uh, what was it called, it was fortunately I don't have anything embarrassing on this computer. Uh, well, anyway, you probably don't want to watch me doing this video here of, of this, so um, what's this one called, 071192 it is, in fact, in downloads. Um, uh, there it is. That's a picture of my dog. And submit. So that will be available to you. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to email me at morrison at olmiss.edu. You already have that email. And I look forward to seeing all of you on Tuesday. Uh, I just wanted to let it go up here. So IEEE TGO STEM paper under content, topical guide objectives. Uh, all right. Have a great weekend. See you on